Hey everyone, and thank you so much for joining me this evening. lives in the COVID-19 pandemic than over the course of two decades of the Vietnam War. Here in Washington State, we've had more than 15,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and to date, over 850 deaths. 30 million people have filed unemployment claims in just the last six weeks, and millions more have been unable to get into the system to file claims. Projections are that we're likely to reach depression era unemployment perhaps even up to 25% unemployment. My thoughts are with every single family who has been impacted by this unprecedented crisis. And my thoughts are also with those frontline workers who are there taking care of us so that we can shelter at home. With so much at stake though, it's gonna take more than thoughts. And that's why it's crucial that we think strategically about the scale of the federal response necessary to address both the public health and the economic crisis before us. And so it is a particular pleasure to be joined tonight by two incredible guests, our very own US Senator Patty Murray, who has been working very hard among other things on a comprehensive testing and contact tracing plan that is extremely necessary if we're to reopen safely. And together we hope to give you an update on what we're working on in Congress to help Washingtonians, as well as an overview of the progress we're making. Our other special guest, and I'm so honored that he's taken the time to be with us, is Dr. Vivek Murthy, the 19th Surgeon General of the United States, who served from 2014 to 2017 and continues to be a leading voice on our nation's public health. So let me start with you, Senator Murray, and turn it over to you for your opening remarks. Well, thank you so much, Pramila. It is a delight to join with you tonight to talk to so many friends and people out uh, who are listening in. Dr. Murthy, great to see you again. It's always a pleasure to, to work with you. And I just want to give a shout out to everybody who is listening or watching. And I know every single person has been impacted by this unprecedented crisis in so many ways, both from a health perspective and an economic perspective. And I just want everybody to know, I carry you in my heart. I know Pramila does as well every day as we work to get through this. Um, before I talk about what's happening in the Senate, I, I wanna talk about how we got here because I remember so well a few months back when people here in Washington state were telling me they were so sick. We started hearing about the nursing home, about cruise ships and no one could get a test. And without that knowledge, they couldn't do what they needed to do, stay home, make decisions about their community or their business or their family. And at in the other end of the country and the nation's capital was like, oh, don't worry, we'll get them. It's no big deal, it's not coming. It was like I was living in two different worlds and I have been screaming at this administration since day one that we need the capacity and the knowledge to be able to deal with this unprecedented crisis. And here we are today and I'm still yelling <laughs> that we don't have enough testing. That knowledge is absolutely critical for everyone. Um, to be able to make the decisions that we need today about reopening, how we make sure we're ready for the next crisis. So um, one of the things I did in the last package that we passed was pushed hard and got $25 billion for testing and a requirement that this administration put together a plan for our nation on how to implement a testing strategy that includes the range of both uh, the supply chain, the equipment, everything we need, the personnel, and what to do with those testing tests once we get them in terms of tracking and tracing and how we deal with this. Um, it's so essential. Um, so it's been very frustrating and we have a lot more work to do. It's gonna take a lot of people and resources to implement this, but I truly believe we're not gonna open up our economy. People are not gonna have the confidence. We're not gonna be able to contain this um, really aggressive virus in any way unless we have that testing knowledge. So I'm, I'm gonna keep pursuing this. We have a lot more to do oversight of this administration. We've given them billions of dollars. We need to make sure they are spending it in an equitable way. Um, so everybody has the opportunity and we're helping all ends of our society. Um, looking back to find out what went wrong so that this doesn't happen again two months from now or 10 years from now. What went wrong with all of this? Why were we not prepared across the board are things I'm really focused on. 
And of course, the next COVID package, Camilla, which I think the House is already beginning to work on, I'm making sure that we deal with the food crisis we now have, the homelessness crisis, the uh, so many people who are out of work, making sure that our state and local governments are supported in this crisis. They have lost so much and just the first line issues that they need to deal with are not gonna be able to be funded. And just back to those basics, so that people, if, when they are sick, can stay home, paid family leave, things like that. It's, it's a huge challenge, but one we're all working on and uh, so appreciate this opportunity to talk and listen to all of you as we work our way through this together. Thank you so much, Senator. And now, uh, Dr. Murthy, let me turn it over to you for some opening comments, and then we'll get to some questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Congresswoman Jayapal and Senator Murray. It's wonderful to be on with you as well. Um, I really admire and appreciate both of your commitment to public service, everything you're doing for Seattle and the state of Washington for the country. So glad to be on with you. You know, to, to everyone who's listening today, I, I first just want to say thank you because the steps that you and people around the country have made to stay at home, the extraordinarily difficult decisions that you've made to turn your lives upside down so that you could protect each other and others in society from COVID-19, that's actually bearing fruit. We did not have a vaccine and we still don't have one. We don't have a medicine that we know is a blockbuster drug for this virus that we will one day. And in the absence of those tools, the only thing that we had in our pockets that could ultimately help flatten the curve of this virus and prevent unnecessary suffering and death was changes in our behavior. And you're staying home, you're ensuring that you're washing your hands and that you're taking the added precautions we know are necessary with a respiratory virus like that, like this, that, that is what's enabled us to at least uh, get our bearings and avoid, I think, what have, could have been an even worse situation. So I want to thank you for that, because I know that it's come at a tremendous cost, that people have lost their jobs, uh, that it's that people are experiencing a great deal of stress. You know, I, uh, I feel fortunate, you know, that uh, that I have a family around to support us, but um, you know, my wife and I have two small kids, three and two, and um, we find ourselves trying to figure out how to work while potty training our two-year-old and trying to figure out how to make sure our three-year-old eats his vegetables while making sure our older parents don't actually leave the house and go out and, and get exposed to the virus. And everyone is dealing with some variant of this, some people in much, much more difficult circumstances. So I just want to appreciate everything you're doing. And as we look ahead, and I think the unfortunate news with COVID-19 is that we're not out of the woods yet. And unlike other disasters that have visited, visited upon us, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes, uh, which have a definite end to them, we don't quite know what the end date is of COVID-19. And that's, uh, that's what I think is partly making this so tough. But because this is so difficult for everyone, it makes it all the more urgent that we are putting in place the right policies, that we have the right leadership, and that we're taking steps in our communities to prepare for what's to come and to ensure that we support people as they take the steps that they need to take and to protect themselves and their families. Uh, and in particular, a few things I would mention, you know, Senator Murray has mentioned the importance of testing. Uh, I just can't emphasize how important that is because all of the other things you hear about that we need to do in order to start opening up safely, ensuring that the number of new cases is going down steadily, ensuring that we have the ability to trace uh, and quarantine people uh, who are sick. These depend actually on testing as well. So I think of testing like our eyes, it's what lets us see very clearly where the problem is so that we can get our arms around it. And if we can't see, then we are quite literally flying blind in trying to address this virus. And so I think that the, the focus on testing is absolutely essential. And with testing, there are three big things that matter. There's how many tests we have, but there's also the distribution of those tests. We need to make sure that everybody, regardless of where they live, what their race and ethnicity is, what their income level is, that they can get a test if they need it. And the turnaround time of the test matters too. Uh, still today, I talk to nurses and doctors and to patients across the country who are having to wait two, three, four, five days to get test results. And that's just still, uh, it's, it's terrible because during that time, people burn in hospitals, they have to burn through protective equipment. Uh, people don't have uh, the security they need of knowing their status. And so they may be uh, you know, inadvertently exposing others uh, to the virus. 
So I think the testing on you know, focus on testing is absolutely essential. And my, my hope and my belief, especially given what I've had the great privilege of seeing around our country when I served, is that we have the ability to do this and to do this right. We have the scientific uh, prowess in, in our scientists and institutions. We've got extraordinary citizens who, when push comes to shove, step up to meet the moment. Uh, and we have the financial resources as a country to do this. But we've got to bring those together at this moment, and we've got to do so in order to reduce suffering and to save lives. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today, and, uh, and thank you again for having me on. Thank you so much, Dr. Morthy. So let me start with a question that I get all the time from our constituents and that have been, has been tweeted at me, which is, um, we keep hearing talk about reopening the country. But I think we all know, and you two have both been leaders in talking about how it doesn't look like flipping a switch. It's not like it just happens automatically. We need to have certain things in place before that can happen. So what does reopening actually mean and what does it look like? And Senator Murray, I know you've done a lot of thinking on this, so maybe you could start us off and then we could get Dr. Murthy's thoughts. Well, I think it's important to remember, first of all, we've never been through anything like this before. So we are all trying to figure it out and do it the right way to make sure that people are safest, stay healthy. Uh, and it's hard. I mean, we all want it to be six months ago right now uh, and go out to restaurants and see our friends. But the fact is that that will spread this virus again. And none of us want to have spent the last month and a half in our homes, not going anywhere, you know, taking all these precautions and then just be right. Oh. Can't write. It's so uh, and I think that was, there's a few things that need to be done. I think testing is a critical part of it so that we know um, that people are safe, but also making sure that where they go is safe. We're, we're seeing some of that now where our grocery stores are making sure there's only so many people in and that they're going up and down the aisleways in ways that have least impact and those kinds of things. But every workplace is going to have to think, how do I look when I reopen to make sure I protect my employees and my customers? You know, no one's going to go back to a restaurant until they know that there is a secure way of doing that. So opening that up is going to be different uh, than opening up, uh, for example, a, a, a doctor's office again for visitors who have maybe they have the protective equipment and doing those kinds of procedures. We, we see it today in factories where we have workers that are in meat factories that are um, contracting COVID and, and spreading it really rapidly because there's not the secure workplaces. And I frankly think that the government and our Department of Labor has a responsibility to put those workplace standards out there so people know what they are and they can have them in place as we try to reopen and assure people that they're safe. Dr. Murthy, what other things should we be thinking about in this reopening? How do we even begin to conceptualize what it means to go back to work when um, we don't have many of the things that we feel like we should have, whether it's PPE or testing or contact tracing? Um, how do you see this issue and, and what we must do and where we are in getting there? Well, it's a great question. And I think the, the truth is that we won't be able to return fully to our normal way of life, where we were able to be in close proximity to others and go anywhere we wanted and assemble in large crowds. We won't be able to really do that until we have widespread immunity of the population. And the quickest way, or the best way really, I should say for that to happen is through a vaccine. Now a vaccine, you know, we know is probably at least a year off there are some extraordinarily optimistic scenarios where maybe we get one by January, but that would everything would have to go right and it would have to be an unprecedented timeline. I think what we have to plan for is that this could be at least another year to 18 months. If we keep that in mind though, that doesn't mean that we're gonna be in lockdown for 18 months. What that means is that we'll have to phase uh, our, our, our reopening. And in the first phase, what we'll see uh, is likely being able to start venturing out into places where uh, crowds are small, you know, groups of 10 or less, where we are still keeping distance from other people, where we are wearing masks in public, where we still won't have concerts and large games. We won't be having conferences, you know, where we have several hundred or a thousand people get together. And we may also in the workplace see shifts staggered. So instead of having 500 people in an office, we may have to see 
smaller numbers come in over the course of the day with teleworking provisions still in place. I think also about people who need medical care. You know, in the last month and a half or so, elective procedures have been put off. But we know that what was not urgent yesterday will become urgent tomorrow. And people need to get their care. They need to be able to see their primary care doctor. Our children need to get their vaccines. These, these things need to happen. Um, and so what we need to be thinking of in medical offices also is how to ensure that people can get care safely. What's starting to happen now more and more is that doctor's offices are letting patients come in, but not crowd in waiting rooms. So people are actually often waiting in their cars. Uh, and then when they get the call to come in, they come in, they're being screened for symptoms ahead of time. And if they do have con symptoms concerning for COVID-19, they get diverted to testing. And you're going to see doctors and nurses, even in clinics, wearing more protective equipment. Um, we have, so we have to make sure they have access to it. Uh, so as we, the, as we do better, uh, meaning as we take these precautions, and ideally if we still see the number of cases remain low, if we have good testing and contact tracing so we can be confident that those numbers are indicative of what's actually happening in our communities, then we can start to open up more and more. We can start to increase group sizes. We can start to, um, in, in, you know, even maybe potentially from time to time, reduce the distance that we have from others. But this will take time. And, and that's why I think as important as public policy is, and I'm a big believer in the power of strong policy to contribute to effective solutions, the other half of this is what we can do and about us stepping up to be there for each other. Uh, this has been an extraordinarily difficult time, but it's also been a very inspiring time for me to see just how people are doing that all across the country, how neighbors are checking in on neighbors, how people are leaving meals at the homes of healthcare workers and grocery store workers because they're on the front lines. Um, and it's that spirit of, that we're going to need because I do believe that government's responsibility is to take care of its people. And our responsibility as citizens is to take care of each other. And we need that now more than ever. Thank you. Um, let me pick up on that with you, Senator, because I know you've been pushing on the testing pieces and also on PPE. And one of the things that occurs to me is that some of us can shelter at home. I'm sitting here in my house and each of us, I think, is. But we have a lot of essential workers who are out there so that we can stay at home. We've got people in meatpacking plants and the food supply chain. We've got people in warehouses. We've got um, our frontline workers, of course, in our nursing homes and in our public health systems and hospitals. So where are we on the question of being able to produce and manufacture, ideally domestically, um, the president has not used the Domestic Production Act. Where are we on getting enough tests, getting enough PPE, so that we can do the things that Dr. Murthy and, and you have spoken about? Uh, well, Pramila, you're, you're speaking to my heart now because my frustration from day one is this administration, the Trump administration, has not taken that question seriously. How many masks do we need? How many tests do we need? How many people do we need to process those? Um, who are our frontline essential workers that included everybody you talked about, including bus drivers and folks that, you know, people often take for granted that are cleaning restrooms. And it, it, there's so many. Um, how are we going to assure that they have that equipment? And that question is, how many do we need? And they have consistently not answered that question, not tried to find it out not tried to uh, make sure that we can build to a capacity of any kind. They've shrugged it off and well, we are fine. Everybody's got something, we'll be okay. It's up to the governors, it's not up to me. This is a national problem. And our supply chain for all of the PPE and all of the testing that goes with it can't be done state by state, city by city. It has to have a national plan to make it happen. And that's why in the last bill that we passed, I put in a provision that will require Trump to put together a plan, that his administration will tell us what they need. Do I think they'll follow the law? I doubt it. But that's what we need in order to be able to have a national strategy to produce what we need, give people the confidence and the protection that they deserve. And you've been on these calls with the governor that we have for the delegation. And you know the idea that every governor is sort of out in the midst of a Hunger Games scenario trying to find swabs or PPE or ventilators and competing with others makes no sense at all. Um, Dr. Murthy, you know, I've heard sometimes people describe public health and the economy and what we do in each as being a trade-off. And I 
personally reject that idea. I actually think that they are one and the same thing, that job number one has to be to beat the virus. And if we're going to beat the virus, we need people to stay home. And if they are going to stay home, we really need to relieve some of the economic pressure. Senator Murray talked about paid leave and some of the things that might be possible there. I have a Paycheck Guarantee Act that would ensure that people continue to get paychecks. But how do we help people understand the critical need for social distancing at a time when we are starting to reopen? Are you concerned that while we may be flattening the curve, we're still seeing significant increases in cases and that the projected number of deaths, according to our um, institute here at uh, of health metrics evaluation at the UW, is that the models are showing that we could go up to 130,000 uh, deaths, double what we've seen so far. How do, we, how do we mentally deal with the idea that we're trying to reopen, we still need people to stay home, and we don't have the equipment and the testing that we need in place as we're starting this reopening? Well, you know, you're describing, I think, what is a, accurately a very difficult situation that we're in because we want to open up, but we aren't doing enough to be prepared to do so. And that just puts us at extraordinary risk. I mean, I think of it sort of in the following way. If I'm driving a car and I really, really want to get out, I need to wait for it to slow down until it's safe to get out. If I say, you know what, I just can't wait anymore and I get out when the car is still moving 30 miles an hour, then I'm out of the car but I'm going to get injured and the consequences are going to get worse. So you have to be ready uh, to, in order to, to open up. And, you know, even by the White House's own criteria, saying that we need to see a decline in cases in regions for 14 days, that we need to have adequate testing and tracing capability, even by those standards, we've not met those in the vast majority of places in the United States that are actually reopening. So I worry about that. And what it highlights for me also and something that I saw you know, very clearly when we were dealing with Ebola and Zika uh, when I was in government, and I know Senator Murray was uh, certainly helping lead the charge on those issues as well. What I saw is just how important and essential communication is during a pandemic. This is one of those moments where you really do have to put aside party and political ideology, and you have to stand behind a scientific approach uh, to address these issues. The virus doesn't really care uh, what your philosophy is. Uh, it will attack regardless. It doesn't care what the, where the border between Florida and Georgia is. Uh, it will cross easily uh, across these borders. And so I, I found that there are a few key principles that are essential here. You've got to be truthful and transparent uh, in communication. Um, you've got to lead with science and scientists, and that means putting them in front of the microphone and the camera, because leadership sometimes is not just about stepping forward. It's sometimes about stepping back and allowing uh, the experts to, to have a voice and to make decisions. Uh, but the other thing that's important here is for communication to be consistent. Uh, and I think one of the things I worry about is uh, in these moments when there's inconsistency in communication, we pay a heavy price for that. It confuses people about what they're supposed to do. Uh, it's been really concerning to me to see face masks, the public use of face masks, become a political issue in communities recently with some people saying, you know, we don't want to wear face masks because we don't think that uh, this is necessary and we don't think that there's a real problem with COVID-19 and other, others saying, no, the scientists are telling us we've got to wear them. The CDC has said that we should do it. A decision on face masks should be driven by science, not by, by politics. But that's why it's really, really important in times like this that people stand together, that they speak with one voice. We've actually traditionally done that as a country during pandemics. Uh, and that's something I feel proud about our country for is that Republicans and Democrats have in the past to together to say, okay, we've got to be unified in addressing what is a common threat. Uh, and there are times when we're 50 states and we make our own decisions, but there are also times where we have to stand together as one nation. And this is one of those moments. If you, if you, if you think about this as a war in, in any case, in any uh, you know, phrase of the word, uh, we would never in war times say, you know what, Minnesota, you, you build your own army, you take care of it and Virginia, good luck. And hopefully it works out well for you. And Florida, you know, here's a little bit of funding, you know, you fend for yourself. We wouldn't say that. We would say we are one nation, we stick together. Um, and that's how it should be uh, during pandemics as well. I, I'll lastly just say that part of leadership from the federal level also requires putting out clear guidance, right, on what we should do. And there are a couple of places where, especially now as we talk about reopening, I, 
I've spent the last several days on the phone with countless nonprofit organizations, universities, and businesses, which are all trying to address the same questions. How much testing do we need? Where do we get tests from? How frequently do we need to test our employees? How many people can be in the building at the same time? And they don't have clear guidance on what to do. They want to do the right thing. They want to do right by their employees, but they're, they're, they're swimming you know, without much direction. And this is, again, a place where it's difficult to replicate the role that the federal government and the CDC have in moments like this. So we actually need more guidance from them in, in times like this, not less. So Senator Murray, I know you're going to have to leave us in a few minutes, and I just wanted to ask if you could give um, my constituents and anyone who's watching an update on what's happening in the Senate. Where are we with the relief package in the Senate? I obviously will give the update on the House, but um, tell us what's happening and also tell us what, what specific things are you pushing for? I know you mentioned paid leave. You've been a big champion of child care. Um, tell us the kinds of things that you think should be in the next relief package and that you're pushing for. Well, we are not putting together a package right now. Um, Senator Mitch McConnell has said that he's not sure we need another one. I think he's finally getting some pushback from some of his Republican colleagues who are hearing from their governors and local mayors and people on the ground when they go home. But we certainly in the next package need to take a look at what we need to have in place to, um, to do the best job that we can. The, the PPE, the testing, all of the things that require us to be able to have the foundation to be able to start moving past where we are today and to be prepared for the next one. We also really need to look at the people who are hurting today. I'm so worried. I've, I've talked to a number of food bank uh, folks who are on the ground and there's a lot of people who need food, making sure that we provide that for people today. If you don't, they're gonna be out getting sick and spreading the disease, making sure that we have the support so if you are sick, you can stay home. Because you can't just say to somebody, stay home, if they are hungry or they need to pay the rent. So we need to think about those just bottom line issues and really focus on that in the next package. Do I think we'll be successful under Mitch McConnell? I think we have a challenge, but we certainly have an obligation to fight as hard as we can, and that's what I'm going to be doing. Let me ask you both to, um, to, to make some closing comments, because I know both of you have to go. And, and perhaps you can both address within that the disproportionality of the effect of COVID-19 on low-income folks, people of color, um, immigrants. Um, we, we have a lot of comments about that and a lot of concerns about what is happening. So um, let me invite you, Senator Murray, I know you have to run, but let me invite you to do your closing comments and then we'll turn it over to, to Dr. Morthy for his. Well, this, this virus um, is aggressive and it goes after anyone. Uh, who is impacted the most is those who can't afford to stay home, um, who are doing those what I call invisible jobs that everybody takes for granted, uh, whether it's your grocery store clerk or the sanitation worker, or somebody who's cleaning the restrooms at the airport. I mean, there's thousands of them. They don't have the capability and they're often disproportionately uh, people of color and often even more women who are then the caretakers of their own children and their parents. So they don't have the capability to take care of themselves, much less make sure they're not spreading COVID. Um, so to me, this has really disproportionately hit uh, people of color, low income people, immigrant communities, women. Um, and we're not addressing that or speaking out at the federal level enough about that and the reason it's important is not just human compassion, which I strongly feel, it's that we will not stop the spread of this virus and continue to impact our health and our economy unless we address that. Thank you so much, Senator Murray, for your uh, amazing work and leadership. And it's a privilege to be in the delegation with you. Thank you. Dr. Thank Morgan, you. Um, turn